business horror stories. Small businesses are the soul of America. And this is where they tell their stories. Brought to you by Proven.com. And we are live. I am here today. I'm really excited to be with Andrew Horn. And Andrew is the founder of Tribute. Welcome to the show, Andrew. Thanks for having me, Pablo. Welcome to the church. Thank you so much. We are actually, so we have to, I have to mention that we are a, here in Brooklyn, New York, in, a, in Andrew's uh, apartment, which is really a loft that is part of, uh, tell me a little bit of the story it's of it. It's a 140 year old Catholic church okay. that three years ago they turned into these incredible lofts and we were lucky enough to snag one when they came on the market. That is just amazing. I don't know how long it will be until Small Business War Stories is hosted in a church again. So <laughs> I, I'm, I'm going to relish the, this opportunity right now. Let's do it, man. Awesome, awesome. So um, I, you started a company called uh, Tribute, and I want to start by saying that I used Tribute recently this past week uh, because it was my uh, mom's 70th birthday, and we did an amazing, amazing uh tribute for her where people from all over the world recorded videos for her telling my mom how much they loved her and I was on the phone with her and she was you know she was crying she was it was a very emotional moment which I'm sure uh, is something that you aim to do uh, with, with with your product so maybe with that as, as a segue you can tell me a little bit more about tribute and and what you guys do and, and what inspired you to uh, to start this well, I gotta ask one important question yes so one of the, the best stat, stats that we track for tribute is called TOJ. It stands for Tears of Joy. Okay. So did we get some Tears many, of Joy? Many out? TOJs were had. So uh, one of the craziest stats about tribute that we've been tracking for about two years now okay. is TOJ. And believe it or not, we run at about 80% of our recipients saying that the person that watched the video cried Tears of Joy. That is amazing. So that's going to have a big impact on you as a founder to, to have that kind of impact on people. It is. It drives us to do what we do, man. It just reinforces that what we're doing deserves to exist in the world, yeah. is having an impact on people, connecting them with their community. Yeah. And so I can loop back around and tell a little bit yeah, more Yeah, so about for our listeners' benefit, maybe just like a quick uh, explanation of, so what, what is Tribute? Yeah, so um, Tribute was inspired by a gift that I received okay. three years ago. So uh, I walked into my apartment on yeah. my 27th birthday. Uh, my girlfriend had planned this surprise party, so everyone jumps out, gives me this massive hug. Halfway through the party, calls everyone into the living room. She yeah. puts up this big projection image on a screen, hits play on the projector, and I'm sitting there. And what I didn't know is that my girlfriend had reached out to 20 of my closest friends and family members, got wow. them all to submit a one-minute video telling me why they love me. Wow. Put them all in this one montage. Were there TOJs in your... There were definitely TOJs. Okay. So I had that moment where a minute into it, it's my mom, my new best friend in New York, and I had this urge to cry, and I just like held it back, and then I was like, oh man, can I curse on this thing? Yeah, absolutely. So I was like, fuck it. I should just like let it rip. And that was the most emotional experience really of like my life. Yeah. Is that, you know, feeling so connected to my community, my friends, my parents. Yeah. I remember I came out of that experience and I said, wow, I just watched my eulogy at 27. Wow. And then I looked at my girlfriend and I said, this is the best thing I've ever received. How'd you do it? She looks back at me without blinking an eye and says, well, it sucked. And I was like, what do you mean? And she was like, hundreds of emails emailing folks. She said, collecting files through Dropbox Drive, text message, and editing it together in iMovie. Right. So literally, in that minute, I knew that this was the most meaningful gift I'd ever received, yeah. and the only reason more people don't get it is because the technology isn't there to do it easily. So Tribute was born. So okay. I started doing them by hand, selling them, and then found an incredible co-founder, CTO, That's great. and uh, launched what is now the best collaborative video editor on the planet, and the Hallmarks are the New Yorker just called us Hallmark 2.0, featured in Today's wow. Show, 50,000 tributes. That's great. Yeah, and one of the things I want to focus on is social entrepreneurship and what that means to you. And I, I'm sure that through tribute, you feel like you're making a big impact on, on people's well-being, um, you know, much more than just having a business, right? 100%. I mean, it's it's why we do what we do is, again, it's like it, the, the first two words of our, of our yeah. mission statement, again, are uh, magnifying gratitude and meaningful connection in the yeah. world. And that's why we're here. You know, when we think about design, when we think about marketing, everything comes back to that, is that we are creating a product yeah. that is amplifying humanity in a really powerful, unique That's way. That's awesome. That's yeah. great. So tell me a little bit, um, I was going to ask you about the, uh, the most inspiring tribute you have seen. So now I'm going to have to put an asterisk in saying that is not your own. So. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's, um, 
there's been so many, man. That's um, what a beautiful dilemma to be able to you know try and find one in there. So I'll say one that uh, that happened recently that really touched me. Yeah. Uh, there was a, a young man named Spencer. Uh, his mom uh, recently reached out and she said, you know, my son's been diagnosed with a very rare brain condition. Yeah. Uh, was just set to go in for. Uh, I think a uh, third of what would be a fourth operation wow. to essentially kind of uh, cure this uh, this illness he was battling. And um, she writes us this story about after he had gone into the operation, she yeah. had created this tribute for him wow. to again gather words of support from his friends and family wow. all over the world. So literally when he came out of his operation, he had lost a lot of motor function. So all he was really able to do is he had this orange stress ball and he's holding this orange stress ball in his hand. Yeah. And she said that while he couldn't talk, she put the tribute in front of him, and he's watching these videos of his family, his best friends, wow. every single one of them saying, I love you, I'm here for you, you're going to get through this. Yeah. And she said that he can't talk, but every time someone he recognizes comes on the screen, he's just taking the stress ball and tapping the screen. And that's the only thing he can wow. do in that moment. And you Man. can tell... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get some TOJs <laughs> right here. It's, uh, I don't know. Well, it's just must be a lot of pollen or, uh, here in Brooklyn. <laughs> Man, I mean, but it's... And so that's, that's what yeah. I look at is, again, that's an example right there where you have someone who's going through a difficult medical journey and you just, like, palpably feel the power of a community connection, yeah. of feeling like you have people there who believe in you, who support you, yeah. you know, and uh, that's the power of tribute. So you don't need to be in the midst of a difficult medical journey to feel that kind of yeah. power, to be uplifted, to be transformed. So that's a great segue to my next question, which is, which is the wackiest tribute that you've seen? Like the craziest, you know, uh, kind of like oddball or, or one that kind of made you scratch your head a little bit. Totally. I think probably one of the best ones in terms of like wacky, silly, um, we did a tribute for uh, the outgoing um, uh, composer of the San Francisco Symphony Orchestra. Yeah. And so he had been there for, I think, 20 years with some of the best musicians on the planet. Yeah. And so all of these people who had such a close relationship, not only were they cracking jokes in this guy, but imagine 40 of the best musicians in the world playing these solos yeah. for their composer. Wow. So I'm sitting there it's and like literally the watching these things come through. Yeah. So that was another one of like the silliest, one of my favorites that have come through. But again, there's so much like weird stuff that yeah. comes through every single day. And it's I'm like, sure. again, the beautiful thing about tribute is it's this context on the internet where people feel safe and compelled to share the silliness, the love, the gratitude. Yeah. And that's not the language of Snapchat, of Instagram, of Facebook. Right. It's there, everyone's posturing. And it's like, let me put my best self forward and be polished. And this is, no, this is an authentic place to communicate with the people you love. That's awesome. And I really believe that, you know, until Tribute came along, that didn't really exist. And that's exactly why, you know, we're yeah. going to be able to scale and take up a, a massive place. Got in, it. Uh, and now that. let me ask you maybe a, l a little bit uh, out of out of left field. But what if you know you want to help people express themselves and express appreciation for people? But what would happen? Uh, let's say that somebody wanted to do a tribute for somebody who you thought were were a terrible person. So let's say like a serial killer or somebody who has uh, harmed many people. Uh, how, how do you marry all that? I would say that any single person who is surrounded and supported by people is more likely to be a good person. Okay. And so if someone is a bad person, is my goal to to criticize this person? Yeah. To like denigrate him or sure. to lift him up? Got it. And I think that again that our role here in people and as leaders is to lift people up. Is to see how we can help, is to empathize, is to have compassion and compassion sure. is simply wanting the best for someone. Let, so let me so let, let, see, let, let yeah. me double down on that. So what if the tribute were all negative messages about like harming other people and everything so forth? I mean, how, where do you as somebody who has is socially minded, how how, how does that I'm trying to put you in a conflicted situation <laughs> Please here. Please, no, I'll take it. So you know what? I mean, what we've seen before, again, is like I've seen frat bros create a roast tribute, which is, again, it's like their, their buddy's getting married, right. and it's like, let's talk shit about our friend for 20 minutes. And it was like, I saw that one, and I was like a little heartbroken. But at the yeah. same time, it's like, you know, maybe that's their language of love. It's just like ribbing each other and doing that stuff. And, you know, I don't judge on that. It's so, you know, we can do and set out to create what we're passionate about, what we think is really serving people and their highest selves. Yeah. Uh, but ultimately, it's a technology, and it's open yeah. to anyone. And so the way people are going to use it, they can go ahead and do that. Makes we sense. just understand the general way that people are going to use it that's going to make them feel amazing. And, Got uh, it. So and you're enable, enabling those, those feelings. To yeah. Out. Totally. Got you. Okay. So let's move on a little bit more to talk about social entrepreneurship in general. So... Uh, you know, social entrepreneurship is this term that is uh, both uh, 
magical in a good way and in a bad way in the sense that uh, it's hard to define. And then it's also, you know, that you have people that say, oh, you're a social entrepreneur, you know, your business doesn't make money. How do you, maybe for our audience's uh, benefit, how do you see uh, social entrepreneurship and, and how do you define it in, in terms of what you're doing? I think that social entrepreneurship is the idea of defining either dual or triple business goals, which is people and profit. And then if it's, you know, triple bottom line, then it's uh, prioritizing people, profit and planet, the environment. Yeah. And so um, I think that true social entrepreneurs don't prioritize one of those any more than the other. They yeah. are all business goals as if our business is financially successful, but we are ultimately harming yeah. the planet. We're harming people. We're not yeah. doing them a service that we generally feel is good for them. Yeah. It's not a successful business. And so that's what okay. social entrepreneurship is all about, is how do we build businesses that are profitable, that are financially solvent, but genuinely having an impact in people's lives Great. that we're personally passionate about. So that means that you could potentially forego uh, a dollar profit uh, in, in exchange for uh, maybe a, a benefit in one of these other areas. Yeah, abs I mean, absolutely. And again, it's, and it's not to undermine any of these things because you right. cannot be a social entrepreneur with without profit. Yeah. It's again, you can be a nonprofit here, you can run like a, a benefit corporate, like our organization, right. but it's to be a social entrepreneur, the essence of it is that again, it's that you have to build a business that works. Yeah. And again, it's when you build a business that works, that's self-sustaining, you're able to magnify your impact. Great. And I think that what's so fortunate is that we live in a time where social entrepreneurs are being lifted up, are being celebrated, are being hailed. Yeah. It's cooler to help a billion people than it is to make a billion dollars. And so, you know, again, I think we live in a well, very... we need more people who think that way, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, and I think that that shift is absolutely happening. And I think that there's a lot more transparency and people see just the, the entire span of what people's lives and their social lives looks yeah. like. And you see that, again, that what is truly fulfilling, what is rewarding is not money, is not the boat, is not the car. That stuff is flashy and exciting. But the people who have the coolest lives and the coolest friends are the people that are serving the planet. Yeah. And it's like, again, it's, you know, you look at Tom Shoes, who, again, created one of the first, like, give back models. Sure. And like, again, then the iteration that's come off of that. Yeah. And like, the evolution of things like conscious capitalism and yeah. all these other things. So I think that it's certainly on the rise. And people understand that the easiest way to tap into fulfillment is helping another human being. Okay. And so, you know, it's not just... Um, a way to impact the planet. It's a way to find motivation because okay. if you're just building something for financial gain, sure. Once you reach financial gain, you'll get there and you'll just say, "Oh, I want more." Yeah, it's it's unfulfilling, it. right. you know what I mean? So, what are some of the myths, maybe along those lines? What are some of the myths that you constantly hear about social entrepreneurship and some of the uh, misconceptions, I guess, out there? And and how 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 do those how are those similar or different from you, from your experience? Yeah, so, I mean, the, the first that I think is that, again, it's that uh, people who have, you know, a, a social mission or classify themselves as social entrepreneurs aren't going to be as successful as someone that's a purely for-profit, sure. you know, entity. Um, but again, I think that that's been, you know, disproven time and time again, where you look at, you know, Adam Grant's book that just came out, Give and Take, and they talk about, yeah. again, that it's essentially, if you look at the Fortune 500s, the individuals who are giving back the most through CSR programs yeah. and through philanthropy are precisely those organizations that are retaining the best employees, yeah. that are growing the fastest. Um, and again, it's just, you realize that um, having this kind of purpose laid in your organization and in your mission is the most effective way to retain good people, yeah. to sustain motivation over the long run. Yeah. And so, you know, that's how I would debunk that first myth. Uh, the second one is that you truly need to be like a direct service organization to be a social entrepreneur. Meaning like a nonprofit, no, or like a, a nonprofit, or like doing work that's development in Africa, or like right. doing sanitation. You know, it's something like that we view as like one of these essential needs. But the reality again is that I think that you can make chairs in downtown Brooklyn. Uh -huh. If you make chairs and you employ a hundred people, but if you define that, hey. I employ these hundred people and we make chairs and yeah. people need chairs. Yeah. People need a fucking place to sit. Sure so this is the thing that needs to exist. Yeah. But the CEO of that company says, I'm going to take such good care of these 100 employees. So I know that everyone in their family has health care. So I know that mentally they are set, that they have good programs. Yeah. They have access to whether it's kind of workout programs, whether it's, you know, access to psychiatrists and emotional kind of like needs sure. that we actually recognize their success and their growth effectively. 
then essentially what he's doing, he's creating a service that yeah. is sustaining these people, sustaining their families, yeah. that is helping them elevate to grow as human beings. Yeah. In my mind, that is a social entrepreneur. That's great. Yeah. That's a great definition because I think a lot of our audience and a lot of people who run small businesses in, in America are, are like that. And they have that, uh, the, you know, the, a, a tremendous amount of pride in, in their work product and a tremendous amount of pride in their employees and the impact they have in their community. So what, what, what I'm hearing from you is that that uh, dovetails really nicely with the, the idea of social entrepreneurship and making a positive impact and having these multiple bottom lines. Absolutely. Awesome. That's 100%. great. So let's, let's maybe break. I mean, I love, I love these ideas and I love the, uh, the, the vibe that, you know, obviously you're a very, you know, you're a very positive person. It's very, it, it's, it feels great to be around you. Um, let's, let's, let's bring the, bring it down to where the rubber meets the road. When is the time when you made a decision as a social entrepreneur that would have been different had you not been a social entrepreneur? Huh. You know, probably one of the first professional decisions I ever made okay. um, was influenced by me seeking some sense of deeper purpose out of my work. Okay. And it was after I graduated from Virginia Tech. Yep. Uh, I grew up in Hawaii. I had family in the hospitality industry. Yeah. And one of the only jobs I could get and to be completely honest, I was yeah. not prioritizing academics at that point in my life. I was much more of a party yeah, animal. Neither did I. So it's okay. <laughs> I was working out. I'm with you, brother. And so one of the only jobs that I was able to get was a job actually working for the Trump Hotel Group in Chicago. They had just okay. opened a building there. And I remember having this revelation. It was a, a very high paying job yep. doing kind of front desk work and, and front of house operations. Yep. And it was the highest paying job I received out of college. And I just remember having this realization before I did that. Uh, that I have zero interest contributing to the hospitality and tourism sector. Yeah. And so there I was. I could have gone and made as much money as I could have ever hoped to make coming out of Virginia Tech with yeah. a, you know, a bad GPA. And I remember just having that realization, like, I have no interest. If I were to do this for 10 years and be successful, yeah. I would be unhappy right. at the end of the day. And I just realized that, and that's what caused me to, again, step away from that. Got you. But then add tribute. Let, let's just put it, so a, or, or any of the social uh, ventures that, that, that you've been involved with. Oh, uh, cool. Uh, are there times when you've made a decision that where the decision was A, because you are a social entrepreneur, but it could have been B if you weren't? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, you know, I think that one that probably comes to mind is, you know, we believe that this service can have such a transformative impact yeah. in the lives of the people that are using it, that at the end of the day, we want to make sure that people can access it. And so we have a uh, developed a pro bono philanthropic initiative with hospitals. Okay. And so what we're doing right now is we've made the tribute platform completely available free of charge to our hospital partners. Wow. And one of the reasons that that's we, definitely something that would have been different. If one, you were purely one, profit one, one of the reasons that we did that again is because we realized that there was a lot of red tape, a lot of bureaucracy to actually get through hospitals. Yeah. And it was a very difficult thing to allocate new funds for something that was unproven, that was a for profit uh, kind of endeavor. Yeah. And so what we made a decision to do is we said, you know what? we think that this can have such a transformative impact on yeah. the lives of patients, people like Spencer, yeah. that we're going to give this away for free so that you can experience it. That's awesome. And, you know, it's been fun to, you know, and you do those kinds of things for, for a philanthropic reason. Yeah. And then we end up in CNN because we're doing this thing that is inherently good. Right. And again, the reason why social entrepreneurs, people who are trying to make, uh, you know, an active effort to give back right. are those that succeed because they are the people that uh, uh, the world wants to support, the yeah. world wants to partner with. So let's actually, that's a great um, uh, segue into the next question, which would be, you know, you're here in Brooklyn. Uh, how do you see yourself as a part of the Brooklyn or the larger uh, New York metro community? And where do you see, Brooklyn's changed a lot. Uh, my dad lived here in Manhattan in, in the 90s, and I can tell you that this uh, neighborhood we're in at the moment was not like this uh, at that time. And it continues to change. So where do you see Brooklyn going and how do you think about Tribute's uh, involvement with the community here? Yeah, you know, um, I, try to, I try to stay fairly active uh, within the, the New York and Brooklyn tech scene. Uh, we, we launched our beta site with New York Tech Meetup, the uh -huh. largest tech meetup here in New York City. Uh, it's definitely a, a changing face, you know. It's like we're here in Williamsburg. I was talking to my fiance Mickey last night. Yeah. Uh, her friend bought an apartment here in 2008. Wow, for, good timing. <laughs> you know, less than a million dollars, which is very difficult to do these days. And when he was here in 2008, there was nothing here 
Whereas, you know, again, the gentrification that exists in these parts of towns, the whitewashing that's happened is, yeah. is very real, you know, and so is the... Uh, and that's challenging to keep because that's, this, the world doesn't look like that, right? It so doesn't it's look challenging. Like that. Oh, exactly. If you're trying to build, you know, a truly global product and it's being run by a bunch of white men, the odds that you're going to be thinking from a place that's going to connect with everyone you want to reach right. is just not there. So and what's a good way to counter that? What's a good way to work to, to make that better? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, just uh, really kind of uh, implementing like diversity kind of principles in your recruiting practices okay. and seeking out those, uh, just making a personal commitment to actually incorporate voices, yeah. opinions, viewpoints that are different than your own yeah. uh, is something there. And, uh, you know, again, something that may seem like more challenging yeah. uh, initially. So what actually, let's, so let's, let's put it to practice. What are the things that you do in your recruiting process when you look for people to, to implement those kinds of uh, ideas? You know, I think about uh, presenting problems that we're currently dealing with. Yeah. And just, I mean, I'm very open-ended when it comes to interviews of like putting very actionable uh, things in front of people and seeing kind of what their, their ideas are about them. Okay. I think, again, it's like the way that I interview people doesn't differ based off of race or gender. Yeah. I think that it does just in my general sourcing of okay. like honestly understanding it's like, if I look at my team and we're like primarily men, yeah. it's like I just understand the need to have a uh, diverse thought pool. Yeah. And so as we're seeking kind of advisors and like designers yeah. to come in and contribute, um, it's just something that I understand is important. Cool. So it's not so much the like the the micro questions or yeah. process of getting them in, but it's just a commitment to actually understand. And, and this is something that you communicate to your team that, that this is important to you? Uh, 100%. Okay, yeah, awesome. Absolutely. Awesome. So where do you see Tribute going in the next 10 years? Where do you, how do you want to build uh, your brand? It sounds like you have a lot of components, again, of social impact. Uh, I, and you, you were talking about Hallmark 2.0. Uh, Hallmark is not a company that I perceive to be a social uh, venture. Uh, so where do you see your brand going in 10 years? How do you see this development? Totally. Uh, you know, when the New Yorker ran that article and called us Hallmark 2.0, I just like, thought about what would that look like? Hallmark 2.0. And the reality is like if Hallmark were to create themselves again today, they wouldn't do it with physical greeting cards. They'd probably do it with video because that's the communication mechanism right. of the future. And really what we want Tribute to be and what we're growing into is the video platform for meaningful video messages. Okay. And you think about all these occasions, a child that gets born into the world, your mom has a 70th birthday, yeah. you know, one of your best friends just passed away. Um, all these moments when you want to share love, when you want to share gratitude, right. when you want to share the stuff that matters with the people that matter to you, um, right now, there is truly no way to share those meaningful video messages. And you want to be them. that, the brand. That and we will be that company. Because yeah. again, you know, where paper products come up short with handwriting, where yeah. e-cards never really filled that promise and were never compelling. When you watch a video from one of your friends, whether it's through text or whether it's on Facebook, it is emotional, yeah. it's personal, it's their voice, it's their mannerisms. And so creating a context uh, for creativity, for comfort, uh, for emotionality on the internet yeah. is, is our ultimate goal. So that any time something important happens, you wanna celebrate someone, yeah. you know the tribute's where you go for that. That's great, that's great. Where can our listeners uh, find you if they're interested in learning more about tribute or if they're interested in learning more uh, about you? Yeah, so go ahead and vid, uh, visit the site at www.tribute.co. That's .co, not .com. Uh, you can also check us out on all social uh, platforms at uh, We Tribute. And uh, we'd love to hear from you guys. And we're going to have a special promo running for listeners of Pablo's podcast. All right. So we'll have that listed in like the show notes so you guys that, can use So that. you heard it here. Uh, you're, you'll be able to have a special promo code. Uh, for tribute and I can tell you as somebody who's personally used the product in this past week uh, it is definitely something that you should uh, check out uh, so it's been my honor and my pleasure again Andrew Horn uh, founder of uh, tribute here in Brooklyn New York really appreciate your time thanks for having me Pablo. all right take care pleasure brother all right. thank you for listening to small business war stories if you enjoy the show share it with a friend or subscribe to our podcast you can also email us suggestions. Is there a guest you think would be great here? Email us at podcast at proven.com. Small business war stories. Small businesses are the soul of America. And this is where they tell their story.
brought to you by Proven.com.